controlled chaos in music. What's up, Daw Nation? Welcome to this week's episode of In The Daw with Levitate, where he's going to break down his song, Shatter. Now, if you are brand new to the channel, totally cool, totally awesome, great to have you here. This is a series where we interview huge music producers like Levitate. They come on the show and they dissect their songs in real time. So if you wanna keep seeing huge music producers actually break down songs that are working for them, right? You don't have to go through the internet looking for a song or sound recreation video from someone who didn't even create the song or the sound in the first place. None of that crap. You can actually see the real music producers, the actual music producers break down their songs right here, right now, then go ahead and hit the subscribe button that is right below this video and take that little notification icon so you get notified every time we put out a new piece of content. Also, if you're on the podcast, I know there is no video, so make sure to hit the follow button, subscribe button, repost button, whatever button is a good button on the particular platform that you're listening on. We're just grateful that you are all here. So Don Nation, there are a lot of things that you're gonna be learning in this week's episode. However, there are four main things that I want you to look out for, okay? Number one is how to make super wide chords. And this is a really cool trick. It has to do with music theory, so stay tuned for that. Second thing that we're gonna be talking about is structuring heavy bass drops. So if you're a really big bass dude, Stay tuned because this is going to be a really, really good tip. Number three, paying attention to small details. You can't create a masterpiece without all the little small details in there. So pay attention for that. And finally, like I mentioned in the intro, we are going to be talking about how to make controlled chaos in your music. And, and truly Levitate's music is basically that. It's basically controlled chaos. There's all kinds of things happening, but yet it feels like it's supposed to happen. So we're gonna be talking about all those things. Also, I do wanna mention, if you really like this episode, if you really like Levitate and the way that he teaches and you like his type of music, guess what? We actually just launched something with him, okay? Something that is even bigger than this episode, okay? It is a masterclass that we just launched with Levitate. It has to do with four songs, right? So um, the song that we break down in this episode, Shatter, it is one of those songs, but there's three other songs you get to learn from. Pitch Black, All That I've Done, and Pins and Needles. So those four songs all together, Shatter, Pitch Black, pins and needles, all that I've done. I've set them out of order basically every single time. If you want to see him break down all four of those tracks, high five. That's awesome. Go ahead and click the link down below or head on over to dawnation.net to check out the Levitate Masterclass. Now, obviously, there are a lot of crazy things going on in the world right now. And, and we over at Daw Nation are very cognizant of that. We know that you know everything that's going on may be affecting you and your family. And so that's why we want to make this masterclass basically accessible to everyone. And so as you know, a lot of our products, you know, $100, $250, something like that. Um, with this specific product, we are going to bring this down so that basically anyone can get it. It's $17, okay? It's just $17. You can learn how to make four, you know, wildly successful songs that are very, very complex to understand for just $17, all right? We want everyone to be able to have this. So if you are interested in getting this masterclass, make sure to go down in the description and click on the link that will take you over to dawnation.net to find out more about the Levitate Masterclass. So Daw Nation, with all that said, let's go ahead and ask our just wonderful, magnificent, this is so painful, video editor Ben to introduce us to Levitate and to take us in the dark. Oh, wait, I forgot to mention one thing. Ben is in this episode. That's super cool. So look out for Ben. Watch out for Keith. You know, comment what you thought he looked like in the, it doesn't matter. Okay, all right, let's get into the episode. Thanks, Ben. I had mentioned earlier with my previous stuff, I did a lot more experimental compositions that would go on for quite some time. So this is a five minute song and the song has a few sections. It's a journey of a tune. Out the gate, I was starting, I wanna start with really sonically satisfying stuff. There's a lot of sound design right out the gate. The finalized version of this is, has an abbreviated intro that is missing this middle section. It just goes straight to having the sub. Uh, that was per request of a pice of Noisia. Right, so as the, the actual song goes, it just goes straight into the this right after. Yeah. 
my main thing was here was like I kind of wanted like a polyrhythm, but funny enough, like what I used to think was polyrhythms was not polyrhythms. This is pretty straightforward, like a four four rhythm. I mean, I guess it's like eight four, like it's but it's not a real polyrhythm. I'm not using actual like polyrhythmic swings, but I wanted to. I was trying to do that. These are actually all just dotted notes, and dotted notes all fall on like the four four grid line. It's just combos of uh, dotted notes that are like eighths and sixteenths. Right from the intro of the song, there's like a reverse, the reverse of the vocals that come in, and then you have this thing, which. To be honest, that's just a straight up like rank and audio resample. Then we have we come into a clap, which was another like sam I used to use quite a bit more like sample pack stuff. We have like just this loop. But like I was saying, this is a composite of dotted notes. So if I split the grid, well, yeah, this is good. So the grid is on eighths right now. And you see these are all, these are, this is a loop of like three eighth phrases. It's one, two, three, and then one, two, three. And then you do that until, you know, end of the bar and loop back around. So you have this like, right. But this is made out of like a loop that has like, duh, 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 right. So it's that kind of like, it gives you that groove of like paradiddles or something funny like that. And then on every other one, I would just reverse it. So it kind of. Right. So that's actually rather simple. I just I just found that sample with like the ring to it. And I just like love that texture. I layered this with a sample from a movie called like Brazil, I think. I think that's what movie it was. It's about a bunch of kids taking over a city. Oh no, City of God. That's a sample from the movie City of God. Yeah, I just wanted room ambience and I wanted it to sound foreign because these like these kind of grooves are not necessarily indicative of like Western US music, I guess. So then I layer that with another sample of the movie City of God. It's just like a kid talking. Pretty simple. This is then side chained with yeah, I side chained it with a ghost. Now like comes like the semi-technical stuff. This is a perk groove made out of Foley recordings of random stuff from a pack called uh, Loop Masters Junkyard Percussion, Junkyard Percussion 2. They're recordings of random metal items. And you can find this, you can find that loop in my splice sample pack. These are all like, you found the mixed one and it includes like the processing that gets done to some of these. For instance, this has a reverse on it with a uh, time stretch. Uh, those are all pretty much straightforward. Some of these jump in pitch, I believe. Yeah, some of these drop or jump in pitch right here. When you play these with the claps, you get this kind of, you get this polyrhythm. It's not polyrhythm, but you know what I'm saying. This whole intro part is like rather experimental because these are just like random stuff coming out of nowhere. I was at a point in my production where I wasn't really paying attention to what any other kind of music was making. And I was just like doing things for the sake of doing them, I guess, because like it sounded cool, which I don't think there's anything wrong with, but I do, perceive, I, I do prefer music with intent more. I had this hard feedback hit that was made. At, this is a resample, but it was made with flangers going into distortion, just like flangers with 100% feedback going into distortion. And I think it started with a snare. You'd take a snare, put a, like two or three flangers on it that have the same time delay and then feedback all the way up and then distort it and you get this like right and i'm running i'm running this sound uh at, with the same groove that that uh these dotted notes have right here it's the same dotted note groove what makes this fun though is um because of the impact hits in the beginning there's like these so i have this like stomp kick right this thing but because of that, when they play together, these now become the response for that. So you have the da 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 ding 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 da 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 da, right? So it was kind of like the idea of like, I really not only want to make a, a, a rhythm composition that isn't just straight, like to the point hip hop beats, but I kind of want it also to call and response on itself. I have these claps that complement the, uh, the feedback. All of these drums together on the intro that I like sequenced individually, in drum rack, which by the way, the reason these are all spread apart is because I start with a drum rack and then I extract chains before I mix down. But so these drums together all sound like this.
Yeah, I thought that was like kind of a cool like that's it's kind of like indicative of like just some more like foreign kind of beat, you know. But yeah, all together with the feedback and everything. By the way, these fills are just made by like jumping like an octave or two. Like that jumps an octave, that goes back to normal. That's normal too, but I think like a lot of them are just different chunks of the same resample. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah. So they're just different chunks of the feedback that comes out. I have this usual like this go-to kind of like rhythm when it comes to fills. If you have like if you have like a regular hip hop beat, just boom, 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 boom. I have this go-to fill that's like do 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 do. Like it's like one, two, three, four, five. It's like in in eighths and quarter notes, right? And so I'll use I use that phrasing on like a ton of stuff just instinctively, or like the turnaround at the end. That's like da da da. That kind of stuff is just very instinctive to me. I think it's I think those are that's like more of a relic of that like early bro step era because like all those guys would always like do that phrasing on the turnarounds. You know, like Skrillex's cinema is like the best example probably. But anyway, uh, yeah, so. So all together, it sounds like this. Okay, and then I have a reverse sample of these vocals. All right, now these vocals are going into a reverb send. So they get sent into a send um, that I later cut in the mix down process. I, I later cut the waveform to fit how I need it to be. So it would be muted. It'd be muted right on the one. But these are just uh, these are just auto tune vocals of random stuff. Maybe this was like someone that sang on one of my songs or something. SM one oh some like shout and scream sample, and then their auto tune pitched up quite a bit and ran into a hard saturator. It's really simple. That's like the lead on Behemoth. That's the lead on a bunch of my stuff. Sometimes it has chorus on it, but that's it's pretty much straightforward. It's like you take a vocal that has a clean inflection, pitch it up, auto tune it, and distort, and you get that. So the thing with the reverb send though is this is sent to a return track, and after the fact, it's actually side chained to the source. Now I had mentioned earlier that reverb is actually a perception of close to far. So the reverb itself is adding farness to it, but in this case, when you do this, when you send it to a return track and then you sidechain it, the source of the sound is still retained as being close up. It's the space itself that is far away. You, so that's the perception that you send to the listener. I do this trick a lot with like snares and that kind of thing. That's really important. Like really, like a lot. If you want to add reverb to your lead, like that's that's the move right there. Is send to a return track and then side chain that to the to the source. So it's just the tails. Okay. So yeah, this goes on until. I bring in a sub that I made with Massive, I believe. But I like use Massive for a lot of my subs. Like no idea why. I think I just knew how to use the synth really well. Yeah, it's like a sine wave. It's a sine wave and a square wave. And they both have envelope on them and they're low pass. I was pretty diehard with it up until like, until I got hired to do the sample pack in like 2006. 18 or 17 and then so i forced myself to learn serum and i was like dude what the, what am i doing so yeah at the time i made i made a lot of sounds with massive though so the sub is that it's really simple just like it's literally it's just the same as an 808 boom after, and after I, finding out about your perfect sub though it's just nothing comes close no yeah this is like an awful patch actually like real talk like i would never like i would never use a non-linear phase eq to like high pass a sub you're i'm just like mangling it this is a resample of the intro of valhalla by jemba jemba and in rl crime yeah i think it's sped up uh it's pitched up 10 because that that snare up 10 um, semitones harmonizes with the song. Yeah, so I pitched up this uh, that, and then I have a low one too. That's on beats mode, so it's it's just it's really staccato, but it's like has the beef of it, right? And as you can see, like I was tuning this because the you know minus two is the same as plus ten melodically. So I think I was paying attention to the note that the snare was hitting. Uh, those two layered together, I was just trying to make like a general like chaos of shaker. Uh, those two layered together sound like this. 
Oh yeah, and they're distorted. But the reason like I can get away with distorting them so much is because they're 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 very staccato. They're like on beats mode on on uh, 25. So it's very very sharp. You know, if I if I wanted to over enunciate that, like the trick here is like with a lot of drums, you put it on beats mode, preserve whatever you want or transients if it's really like getting your, the transients right, and then you just bring that down and you can like. That's a shaker. This rings through the whole time. Just keeps on going. Goal here, like so much more like interpretive with my music, you know, is so much more about like impulsive feeling. So the goal here was just like build tension. I don't care how, just build fast tension. This is like probably the first song that I started doing like drum and bass influence techniques. And like, this is kind of the, that that case right there where I was like using dotted notes at 160. What later comes in is these two patches of operator saw waves with LFOs on the pitch, but the LFO is on like 2% and it's really fast. So it gives you this like, like chaos sound. And the trick here for like super wide chords, you make your chord progression and whatnot. So this is an F. Draw your whole like F chords and whatnot. And then you pan one hard left and do the opposite notes of your chord progression hard right. All right. I think I did that on this. If I didn't, then I missed out on a great opportunity. Oh, so I just did the same here. I did the same here. But if I, so I, I essentially just missed out on a really good opportunity. Uh, what I would do, if you want to make chords sound like extremely wide let's say we're like doing f right and what you do is like make like multiple octaves of the chord itself you know and then so i'll make two octaves of f and what you would do is you pan one hard right layer two of the same synth pan one hard right and one hard left and then have the opposite notes on each one right for over over the course of two octaves and so technically those two synths are are actually not playing any of the same information, but because it's the same chord, they like ha still harmonize with one another. And you get, this is like, this is a really bad example, but you'll get this effect like this. Oh, this is low pass. Yeah, this is like very processed, not for this, but like you get this. If you do that over the course of like four or like three octaves, three or four octaves, and it's like a really large instrument, that can get you space that's unbeatable, frankly. Like it's, it will just make things so massive. That's like classic engineering, like kind of stuff. Like if you were like to look at like how a rock opera was engineered like Queen's rock opera songs, they'll pan like a harmony right. Like one of the voices will be like hard right. And then like the third will be like hard left. Do you know what I mean? That's kind of the trick with that. That's also very similar to how like guitars are panned. Evidently, I didn't exactly do that here. I just had hard left and hard right. Cause I, yeah, cause I think they like the detuning was at a different rate or something. I don't know, man. If you're, if there's not actual differences in your left and right channel, then there's like no reason and in doing that. And if this is like a, a pro tip, by the way, people will take like really wide sounds and they'll pan them hard left and hard right. And they'll be like, see, dude, it sounds bigger. It's because Ableton has no pan law. There's no ratio that allows Ableton to dictate what the compensated volume would be if you send everything left and send everything right. So my point, what I'm saying here is that when you pan something hard left, it turns it up like 3 dB in the left channel. And the same thing with hard right. So if you take one sound and duplicate it and then pan one hard left and hard right, the reason it sounds better to you is because it's louder. That's it. You just turned your sound up 3 dB and doubled your CPU processing. Yeah, so like if you pan things hard left and hard right, like inside of Pro Tools, it'll sound completely different. And then if you do it inside of Ableton, wow. same with Logic. Yeah. Well, actually in Logic, you can switch between two of them. Sadly, I didn't do that here. I just oh. like left these panned hard left and hard right. I think because I didn't know, I didn't understand at the time. I don't think I knew about the that phenomenon at the time. And I thought it was making it wider. But in reality, I could honestly just take this one track and turn it up 3 dB. And it's going to be the, like the same exact thing, really. These have, this has a flanger on it. I'm using the flanger to do a similar effect as a chorus. I just wanted to spread them larger, but be like added about it you know three years later i probably just would have used a good chorus and like <clears throat> adjusted the settings good then on the eq8 taking out a lot of 3k and then this is just side chain to when the snare comes in and these hit with an impact sound pretty standard i think that was like an old like 2010 dubstep kit i have a super high end this is like the same chords that are be that are being played in the intro 
Um, they're up like maybe two octaves or something like that and a uh, high pass. So it's just the chaos up top. I just want to, this is just to add like an extra layer of air, which is the only way that I've found to actually fill out the high end like cleanly, unless you want to like add like white noise or something silly like that. So these just sound like this. And I think they're a bit distorted. Yeah, they're... Yeah, they're like mega distorted, actually. Some reverb. It's literally just like high-end chaos that harmonizes with that. The key, the key with all the like mega pad, like the big like super saw stuff. Like I'm sure there's a lot of videos on this, but the key with that is like layering stuff that harmonizes. You just stack like something in each frequency range that harmonizes, and you'll just it'll be beefy by the end of it. Um, this is just a chaos synth. It's like only it's only like one note it's not even harmonizing it just has like a ton of like detuning on it you know like this is just straight up a saw wave okay oh oh it's the f it's the formant thing yeah yeah i used to be like i used to really like that it's that's another i was doing this wrong man i like did a bunch of stuff wrong but like what i was looking for at the time was the sound of an fm synth that like when you have the low when you have like a low uh fundamental and then a high fm you get that grindy metal metal stuff this is like the way of me like making the top end for that in massive so he's just like format thing um that always would just bring this out and so i layered that in there to like have uh, just some like you know high-end siren thing bass which is just a i think it's yeah it's a pretty like standard reese it's just like a detuned distorted saw wave oh it's not even a reese really this is just a detuned saw wave that's it yeah, and I was using this. This is another, I still do this to this day. I'll just layer in one really, really like clicky low end saw wave just to make sure the listener like really knows like what that fundamental is. You know, like you really know like where the buzz is coming from. And then that is layered with the straight up sub. This is like one of those wave reeses. This this actually was a preset, and then I low passed it back when I used presets. I mean, I think this is probably the only preset I used in this song, but it was a Rankin Audio like electro lead, and then I low passed it and used a filter for like or a flanger for detuning. Limit it, low pass it again. Can you solo the sub and the the mid bass together really quick? The sub and the mid bass, yes, I can do that. Dude, that bass, that like zipper bass is like actually like ear piercingly bright. It's just like just having those clicks in there. I don't know. It always made a big difference to me when I was making these pads. But all together, all of these added together, especially after like gain staging properly with these sounds, you get this nice like... And the reason there's so much room in the mid-high is because that's where the vocals take up right here, so. Those really don't sound all that tight together, but if I filled out that mid-high zone, then those vocals would have no place to, to sit. I have some reverse effects, a reverse reverb, a reverse crash, a reverse like Foley, all of those lead into... I was I also used to be very like elaborate with my Foley design, so there's like a, always a lot of layers to make these like rather simple kind of sounds just to fill spectrum areas. Right, so it's just like a clap, like a sample of high-end metal with the delay on it, another metallic sample, another metallic sample that just like layered together right, one's pan hard left, one's pan hard right. And then I layered this with an Ableton patch that's like, that's like, yeah, the Tinkle Fine Bell with like a phaser on it and delay and reverb. So this actually like doesn't hit many frequencies besides the root itself, but that phaser gives it this timbre. Yeah, which I, I like really love that sound. Um, and then using a contact patch, I use this contact patch. It's it's frozen now, uh, so I can like take this this project on the road without my hard drive. But using this contact patch, it was an organ. It was like a vintage church organ. And then I play in MIDI, I play like the chord of F that escalates in like six octaves. So it starts with like F zero into like G sharp zero into C one dot 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 all the way this sounds like this i love that sound and when you mix that with the bell you get this kind of glass sound 
And that's actually probably like my favorite element in this song besides the the shatter sounds that, that comes on the drop of this. But with all of these like leading into one another, this all sounds like this. There's also some swooshes. I like added white noise, added a crash, all that good stuff. Another crash, like really OD. Like you got, you got to be like, you have to overdo everything if you wanted to sound overwhelming, you know. So it's like, sure, three crashes. Let's go nuts. The vocals here are Mary J. Blige's voice, which like no one is supposed to know. Yeah, this is actually pretty simple. Her voice is just pitched up. Um, there's a multi-band gate because like in that acapella, th this is like one of those like YouTube rip acapellas, but there was a lot of like artifacts I wanted to get rid of. Auto-tuned, like hard T-Pain style auto-tuning. Clip distorted, so it's like that technique I was talking about. The only difference here is I added like a lot of fl flanger on her voice and then a chorus after that. And there's like reverb automation. But this is like, I was like also, I mixed a lot less while I worked at this time. So these are pretty much like straightforward effects, you know? And then it's limited. And so it's like, there's nothing really like, you know, crazy about this, but it just sounded really good on the tune. Oh, and then there's like those, the fills, you know? just like being distorted. So this is all, this goes in a linear direction. I mean, as far as the side, you know, it's just like chords, F minor, pretty straightforward stuff. Um, it, it's just, I, I think it's like kind of important that when you do, I don't know if I did that here, but when you do top end instruments, it's pretty, yeah, I didn't do that here, but generally speaking, you'd want to take your top end in instruments and harmonize with the higher notes. Like if, for instance, I took this screamy synth, and instead I played like the fifth. This, act, this section would actually sound a bit more musically entertaining. You know, with everything like all layered together, it would sound a bit more like, yeah, powerful. Um, but anyway, so what happens here is much like the intro, I introduced dotted notes that are just made out of that. At this point, it's just the snare and that uh, metal feedback thing. So I have this like old dubstep snare, I think is what this is. So I have this old dubstep snare, and then that is layered with those feedback sounds from the intro. But it, it goes back to the thing that I was talking about where it's like songwriting though. Like that's really like what's gonna, you know, save you when your production, like, like yeah, if you're not like this like perfect noisy level producer, like songwriting is what's gonna make your art special, you know? And so like that, I feel like the tension of the chords with everything was like really good for where it was at. But this, this leads into, by the time this like actually builds up all the way, and gets to a resolving point, this leads to like the shatter sound, which is this part right here, so. And so I'll stop there. Um, and the best I can do at this stage in this is just talk about how I made that. I can't actually show you because even like further beyond the fact that I froze this to teach people this uh, when I was away from home, uh, beyond that, even when I was working on this song, I had frozen the sound quite early on because my CPU was like absolutely bricking out. So I had to, I had to actually flatten this and get rid of like all the extra things that was causing that but i can talk about how i made that the mentality right here being is like we've built this whole like musical scenario like it's so epic and then just like the hardest turnaround you could do the way that i made this it's like you take you take about like four tracks and you group them together like four audio tracks and group them together one of them 
was a kick. One of them was a synth that was made from Massive. It's just essentially was like a detuned sine wave with like a decay on it and it would rumble. So the way I did that was like with a filter, I would make the filter go exponentially slower. So the filter would make it go like whoop, 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 like that. And it was a sine wave that was detuned in stereo and then it decayed in volume. So you layer that, it goes kick, that layer. There's a vinyl crackle. There's like a crackle that was from a needle, from a vinyl needle, and then a metallic foley, like one of these, uh, like that's I use in the intro a lot. It's like one of these that has a sharp note to it. Like one of those, but you know, the other way, like like that. It was like one of those um, that had a more sharp note to it with a lot of, quite a lot of reverb on it. Oh, and finally the, the sub was a bit bit crush. Now you take all those layers and you bust them into a group and then you use Isotope's warm saturation on the whole group, a little bit of OTT and a bit of sausage fattener just till it starts clipping and then maybe limit it one more time after that. And I think there was also use of like a straight compressor being the first thing because I wanted those the shake to really compress things. But yeah, if you if you distort all those things together and you've really carved out your your frequencies well, you'll get this really like nice, this thing, you'll get this like kind of almost cinematic sounding kind of, oh, oops, almost cinematic sounding kind of like hit. The impact is really the sound of like that kick causing compression on the vinyl noise, but the tail of it is the decay of the, the Foley with reverb. And then it's all sitting on that pad of bass. Oh, and, and then you, of course, you hear the you hear the redux on the bass on the top. And you have to, by the way, you have to EQ all of this like very, very aggressively, like truly, truly aggressively, because I had to use something like two OTTs in the chain for the top or for the group. And with that much upward expansion, you have to like subtractively EQ the high end on that redux, like minus 60 dB or something. Like it's, you have to almost like low pass it, but you can't low pass it, you know? Okay, so this all... Uh, I, I use a polyrhythm, that like dot and note polyrhythm kind of thing with this as like a phrasing to transition you from intro into the vocals. And the vocal chain, albeit it looks complex, it's really not. These vocals pitched up, it's the same stuff. Um, these vocals pitched up seven semitones, some alloy to get rid of excess, excess like room ambience, auto-tune, and then saturation. The reason there's a sinoid fold saturator after that is to warm it up after the fact. That actually doesn't really clip too hard. Then EQ, and I like the CLA vocal stereo. Yeah, I don't actually know. I don't actually know what the stereo effect is here, but it's always has seemed to be a lot cleaner and more organic sounding than like just throwing a chorus or a Haas effect or like all that. I don't know what this is specifically, but this exact one sounds really nice to me. Is this one of the rare examples where you haven't read the manual on that yet? Yeah, dude. No, I actually haven't. I, I so funny enough, I did. Uh, I did watch the video for the JJP. The uh, J Jack J John Joseph Puig, I think is his name. The JJP vocals, and because I was, they have this like parameter on that VST that's called magic. You can't just call something magic and just walk away with that. And it's it's essentially an OTT. Like I I kid you not. It's like just multi-band dynamics. I don't know what kind of stereo effect that's doing. Oh, I have a delay for the intro of this as this builds up. And then it has reverb on it as it builds up and low passes up. And then it finally leads into the drop. So that's all that's really happening for the buildup. And then I have, um, as I mentioned from Pitch Black, one of those exponential breaks. Oh, actually, no, I, this isn't even an exponential break. This actually was just a distorted like drum break that I think I sped it up like times four. Yeah, it's like times four speed. And then it just low passes up some reverse metal stuff and a reverse reverb. I At this time, I really, really did a lot of Foley work in my music, probably more than I do now. I just have, I use it more intentionally now. As opposed to places that straight up drums would just fill, I used to do like mad Foley fully work. But yeah, so all this together sounds like this.
obviously there's like a overwhelming amount of sound design there. So yeah, it's going to be a bit to dive into, but which by the way, this distorted break thing though, this, this was the wrong sample. My computer found the wrong sample for that, but whatever. It would just, it just sounds like drum chaos. That's it. It just sounds like a, like a D and B break. That's like low passes up. Um, but okay. So yeah. I have a chopped version. That's another reason that I resampled this. I have a chopped version of the of the shatter impact sound, and I believe no, never mind. I didn't low pass it, so or high pass it. Yeah, it's just a chopped version of that. It's pretty straightforward, and I just added a fill. I think it just probably jumped. Yeah, I just used a different chunk of it. I guess I just like chopped it into three. So that sounds like this. Um, it's just literally the the low boy, high boy, low boy. <laughs> Um, that goes into a snare, which then this is where like the beef of the song kicks in, you know? Yeah, that actually is straight up the snare. I think I have a white noise. Ah, there we go. I have a clap. And the clap is distorted, not even distorted. <laughs> Just the clap. This is what I was talking about where like, I use Foley work for a lot of the plays that just straight sounds or regular drums could fit in. So with that snare, I like layered in this like metal thing. And the reason I do this is I don't do this so much anymore. I'm a lot more about like playing with the listener going up and down through the spectrum. But at the time, I was very adamant about filling the spectrum like almost all the time. So what I would do is do things like this and like add elements very quiet in the mix that would fill the frequencies up by like 12K, 13K. So I also layer it with this on the snare. That's the clap. See, like, I don't know if that technique, like, here's the thing. I don't know if I would still recommend that technique all the time, but at the time it definitely worked. It like gives you a phenomenon of like, okay, nothing is lost in the high end, but this is still like just a snare, you know? So I noticed, I don't know if it's the same concept, but in your uh, Crywolf flip there's one of those tones going throughout the entire intro yeah it's like because with those instruments when you have something that is that warm and has such tension like there's nothing that you can really add to the high end that will fill that space unless it is like literally like artistically arbitrary unless you're doing it for a very artistic reason you know so with all that i added a scream in there this is like totally arbitrary i could uh, the, uh, Song would probably be a little bit better without this, to be honest, but I added a scream with the snare. Just like straight hype, I guess. Like that's why I was doing that, is just energy. I, I used to do that a whole lot more than I do now, too. But with all that, it hits pretty it hits well all together, I think, you know? And then I'll and then we went through the vocal chain. So it's just a it's just a chop of those vocals. And so the vocals are sent to a reverb that side chain to the vocals, like I like I mentioned earlier. And what I had ended up doing while I was writing this is I, I had everything rather like stripped away and I just had the impact noise and some vocals. And I kind of it was very like the same way mid tempo is. It was very like kick, snare, kick, snare. And I like really hated it. So I rewrote this whole section to be like a hip hop beat and sequenced all the sounds that I had made to that hip hop beat. So that's why you hear the vocal hit exactly the same time the kick does. So it's like, that's why it hits like that. Cause I was just going with this like drum beat that I made, right? And like just all together, the drums themselves. I would not recommend this by the way, do not. I You'll hear a lot of opposing concepts from like different producers but like straight up because of phase issues i would not recommend designing a top end to your kick like real talk i want to do that i had like an uh, i had a pop to the kick and i had the the low end oomph of the kick like layer together just find a kick that works like straight up i i, I wouldn't recommend doing that but anyway so the drums themselves That's like straight, just like a hip hop Lex beat. Luger ride. The overwhelming amount of sound design that you hear honestly just comes from the fact that like there's all these dumb little things like layered in there, like metal stuff. So if you want that, like that'll definitely get you there. And also it's like that forced composition from the hip hop beat. When those like go together, it sounds like almost like too much for a song. Right when the kick hits, I designed a little like a wub wub for the sub. It's just like is another massive patch. Dude, I honestly wish I didn't do that so much. But anyway, it sounds like this. <laughs> Just destroyed the phase on that. Anyway, it sounds like this. Wub right. wub and massive patch go in the same sentence, definitely. Dude, it's pretty simple, dude. I'm just like automating this like harm this sign harmonic 
wavetable to like turn up and down with the thing. So it has just like a boom, 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 boom. Uh, you could honestly like completely body this sound with serum. And then I'm using Max Bass, just like destroying my sub some more. I mean, I'm sure at the time that sounded all right through my monitors, but like Max Bass with these two things mixed together is just like because because they're non like, they're non linear EQ. So you're like, just like what we're yeah. talking about with Pitch Black, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm just sending like signal that's straight up canceling out to my limiter. That's why this sub like it's super loud, but it sounds like weak. Like, dude, in, in the actual bass, that's, like, weak. It's not going to sound the same because I designed it with that nonlinear stuff. But if I do, like, this, for instance, like, even with this nonlinear, like, low pass, you can immediately hear the, like, actual bass, like, clean up quite a bit. Bro, like, I don't know. There's just a million ways I could have done this better. Yeah, so I have that layered with the kick. I also didn't use the sidechain during production. So, like, this has none of those on it. I just, like, saved it all for the mix down. This all goes until the next snare... First snare hits, your main lead phrase. Second snare hits, fill. That goes into the next kick, right? That's like pretty standard music production stuff right there. That's pretty standard like dubstep composition where it's like hit on the one is like your hit. Once the snare hits, your lead comes in. And then on the second snare, you fill. Go back again. Do that three times and then you have a bridge at the end. That's cinema. That's like every Skrillex song from that album almost. That's like every bro step song from that era. You can name the bunch of them. They're all like exactly the same. I did that on this one because we I was so far away from it at this point. Like, dude, this is not like, this is not dubstep. You know what I mean? So I was like, yeah, I'll use that structure. I know it totally works. And this is like very highlighted by the vocal fills though. That's when like the attention is grabbed again. So we have this. That's like the turnaround. So this loops around three times and then I bring the chords back in for the bridge. It's like a mini bridge and then a fill noise. So I'll explain the, the, the fill noise is going to be the thing that like perks your ears up. I'll, I'll get into that. But by the way, this little metallic thing, dude, straight straight up dubstep technique. Like I, if you listen to dubstep in like 2013, you'd be like, yeah, dog, that's like every song, but it's a massive patch. You just like, pit, it's a pitch bend on like a detuned pitch cutoff thing. And it just, yeah, there's so many songs that have that. The only difference with this is it has that small room reverb thing that I talked about. And then there's some Foley's that go clunk clunk before it. Pretty simple. They're like fun sound. Uh, this guy right here. This thing, I can even find it. How this was made is it's a sampler. I took a uh, cowbell, like really clean 808 cowbell, and I put it in a sampler, found the Runo, and then I believe I put a grain delay on it, and the grain delay was an octave up, and then, so it's just a cowbell and a sampler, then grain delay. And then in MIDI, I sequenced the exact opposite of what I had mentioned earlier. So it's like a high, like, like it's, it's like F minor chords, right? So it's like a super high, like C6 goes into G sharp five, goes into F5, goes into C4, dot, 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 dot. It's playing the F minor triad chord, but starting all the way from the top and just sweeping down. And then I panned it left and right. And it's really, I believe if I remember right, it's just that grain delay that's like set to an octave up that makes it sound so so nutty. Like it's like uh, this effect right here, grain delay. And then you go like an octave up on pitch and set the frequency to like ballpark, like two, 2K to like... 7k area and then like time down here dry wet 100 and you get this like clunky kind of but the, yeah so it's in that chain it's in that chain of just a cowbell just going like and so it sounds like this the other way sounds equally as dope i just reverse the midi it's like it's exactly the same yeah this is kind of like tricky to do these bridges because you have to make the cadence like match where your beat is like for instance these are the two turnaround chords from the intro but i had to like chop them into the beat phrasing so it's kind of like tedious in in the DAW itself so it's like and there's just a reverse in between the thing is i think a lot of producers know how to do these things they just like don't necessarily do the the like micro adjustments like adding like this stuff you know what i mean like i think it's just like those little things like gloss over these movements and make them sound like like this thing 
Yeah. Like without that, it just really doesn't sound as tight. You know, like it's without that thing, it's. That obviously works, but it's just it, with adding these little things. The attention um, to detail. You can't have a masterpiece without attention to detail. I agree with that. There's doing, there's definitely going overboard, which the song has a lot of, you know, a lot of that. But there's, I, I would prefer to go overboard than underboard when it comes. Is that a phrase? That You know what I'm saying? To do, like not do enough. Uh, so the part two is the same, but I believe there's just a few melodic switches. It's like actually really similar. It's actually exactly the same, but like you can tell I was from that trap era because I just added the 808 hi-hats and like that was good for me. Like that was, I'm just like, word, 808 hi-hats, great. <laughs> <laughs> and then the only difference is the chords are opposite here. They don't go, eh, no, they go, no, no, and then a reverse of the, the cowbell thing. But yeah, so that rides out. Now this next part, like I have, I've already explained how I made the impact noise that that impact sound. There's a certain like romanticized version of drum and bass in my head. There's like this certain sound in drum and bass that I subconsciously have always really loved, both consciously and subconsciously. And when I was writing this song, it's like one of the higher tempo songs. It's not up by 170, but it's 160, so it'd be like a slow drum and bass, but. It's this combo of like chaos and polyrhythms with having like very low and high timbres that I'm like really obsessed with. There's like a certain certain niche of drum and bass that does that does it really really well. Broken Note I think is a really good example of that of just like controlled chaos with like an absurd amount of bass and high end at the same time. And when I had this this impact noise I was like, dude, let's like make one of those, you know? Like I wanted to like hear that fast kind of, not polyrhythmic, but chaotic drum sound with like this sound. And so that's where that's where this this part leads into. And like I said, it's like a lot more like free form arrangement. And so I was like, let's just send it, you know? As I'm sure you'll notice, there's no snare in this part. That is like entirely like on purpose. That is fully a conscious decision. The reason I didn't add a snare to that part, which I saved for the end, the reason I didn't add a snare to this part is because I wanted to achieve the sound. Like, I just really hate doing the same thing over and over again, you know, like every single song like has a snare or whatever. And so I wanted to achieve the sound of like percussive chaos and not have to add that clack. To me, it's like, yeah, instinctively it, it does like a, lack a little bit of satisfaction but I prefer that over like the obvious satisfaction mm. of having a snare there. It's like a transitional phase, you know? Exactly, exactly. And it was just like, yeah, like the goal was just like chaos. <laughs> And that's just matched with a riser and some reverse drums. And then the rest of the song is actually rather self-explanatory. It goes into this bridge right here that airs out with some, some wind effects, sound effects. The, the feedback is a real easy one. Just make those feedback samples and then just stretch it with complex. That's like really easy. Just flanger, ton of distortion, resample, stretch it. low pass in the vocals i thought that the song went differently but i guess i low pass in the vocals here there's a kick that low passes up that's like a handy effect to do for this stuff I keep these like ARP rises going, but the best I could do is pitch them because I didn't have the patch when I was finishing the song. So like they're just pitched 
differently as opposed to like in MIDI. Yeah, this just goes into like chaos part two, to be honest. Instead of like satisfying right on the drop, I have like a moment of pause and then it just surprises you. And then it's just chaos part two with a clap where I brought the snare in finally. Whoa, that was not the right sample. I'm guessing my computer found the wrong sample. Yeah, there we go. So that, I mean, that's like the same exact beat that was going on. It's like a little bit stripped down and then I just add a snare on that upbeat. Yeah, I mean, that's like the rest of the song. I think it, this ends out with with that. There's something in um, like scoring arrangement and in scoring music theory that's called, it's called like a continuous cadence or something like that. A, a, oh, a ca cadential extension or something like that. And that's like what I'm doing here, whereas instinctively the song would end 16 bars after that initial drop, but I just extend it for eight more bars for no reason besides just adding tension. And so it's kind of like, it's kind of like redundantly long, but like it's supposed to be so I can like bring in the riser and then finally just exhale. So it just. And that, that adds with a uh, resampled like shatter noise just stretched out on complex. It's pretty simple. I feel like it's it's little things like that in moments of in moments of pause and moments of, of clarity that like will really, really keep your listener in the pocket and make your song not sound long and not arbitrary. It's like those little my homie Steven calls them ear candy. But yeah, I mean that's like the whole song, honestly. The reason there's so many stems for what it is, like if you notice with all that I've done, I think that song is like 40 stems, like on the on the dot. It's like 40 stems, which is like a bit smaller than I would go normally. But that song also was like my most successful song last year that was like independent. You know what I mean? So it's like that really like it really doesn't matter. The reason that this song is so it has like 76 stems, which like, all right, producer nerds, you can chill because like I have had songs with like 150 stems. Not every single song has to be 100 stems, my dude. 76 to me is still hefty. It's big because at the time I was doing a lot of like unnecessary things. Like for instance, like just this high end effect is like five stems just to make this sound. Crazy sound, but like, uh, to be honest, you could just find a dope clap that sounds metallic and they would probably do the same job. But yeah, so there's there's a lot of extra things like that in the mix. What's up, Don Nation? Did you enjoy that? Did you learn a lot? Now listen, don't head out yet because there are still a few things that we need to talk about before this episode ends, okay? Number one, if you really did like this episode, please go hit the like button. Uh, leave us a little comment below. If you didn't like it, that's totally cool too. Go ahead and comment below. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Also, make sure to hit that subscribe button and tick that little notification bell so we get notified every single time that we put out a new episode. Also, if you're on the podcast, I understand you can't leave comments unless you're on SoundCloud. I guess you could do that. But do whatever is appropriate to let us know that we're moving in the direction because the more comments that we get, the more you know, messages that are sent to us, the more feedback that we get, the more type of episodes we'll put out like this, you know? And so if you really like this and you want to keep seeing stuff like this, let us know. We'd love to hear from you, okay? So a couple of other things that we need to talk about. Of course, like I mentioned at the intro of this episode, this episode is sponsored by the Levitate Masterclass. So if you really enjoyed this episode, right? You really enjoyed Levitate and what you learned today, then I'd highly encourage you to check out the Levitate Masterclass. You get to learn four songs from him, right? So Shatter is one of the songs. So there's three other songs on there. All that I've done, Pitch Black and Pins and Needles are the other songs on the little masterclass, but it is so good. In fact, Shatter, like this was a really good episode, don't get me wrong, but my favorite one is Pitch Black. I mean, the, the knowledge and the wisdom, oh my gosh, and that episode is insane. In fact, a lot of the things that we talked about in this episode referenced Pitch Black, and so there are a lot of really deep concepts. Like, it's it's really hard to blow my mind music production-wise nowadays, just because I've been I've done so many episodes, been doing this for like 10 years, but genu gen gen generally? genuinely, genuinely, 
Levitate blew my mind over and over and over and over again. And so if you want to check out that masterclass, go ahead and hit the link down in the description, or you can head on over to dawnation.net to get more information over there. And of course, like I mentioned in the intro, you know, it's cr crazy things are going on in the world, absolutely insane things are going on in the world. And so we want to be able to make this masterclass basically accessible to anyone, anywhere in the world that would really love to learn how to make this type of music. So this masterclass is only $17, okay? So if you are interested in that masterclass, go ahead and hit the link down in the description or head on over to dawnation.net. Also, we have other courses and masterclasses over on dawnation.net that you may be interested in. You know, one of them is the Zodiac Masterclass where Zan Griffin breaks down 14 songs that went on to get over 100 million streams, which is insane. You can check that one out. We also have the School of Bass, you know, the classic huge sound design course with AU5. So if you are interested in any of those, go ahead and click the link down below, which by the way, we actually have two more courses that are coming out very quickly. Um, one of them is the Serum Masterclass, which is really, really cool. In fact, if you want to pre-order that, that'd be fantastic as well. You can find that over at dawnation.net. And we also have another pre-order going on, which is the Crywolf Masterclass. Okay, if you guys know Crywolf, he's, he's insane, absolutely amazing songwriter, and he's going to be doing an entire masterclass about his creative process, how he can consistently be able to excavate these amazing ideas, these amazing um, feelings and be able to portray them. Oh, it's, it's just, it's incredible. Okay, he also breaks down a bunch of songs. There's there's so many things to teach you how to write lyrics. I mean, that thing is absolutely huge. So if you want to pre-order that, you can pre-order that as well. But Dot Nation, with all that being said, thank you so much for watching this week's episode of In The Dot. And make sure to come back here next week because next week we are releasing a new episode of Behind The Dot. Now, if you don't know our Behind The Dot series, it is a series where we interview huge music producers, music industry experts, singers, songwriters, sound designers, everyone in between on an emotional, philosophical, branding, marketing, and overall music business basis. Basically, every the whole package of what you need to be a successful music producer, songwriter, rapper, apparently, um, anything like that, you can find over here on Daw Nation. In the Daw is more technical stuff like we did today. Behind the Daw is more emotional, philosophical, branding, marketing stuff over there. So with that being said, Daw Nation, we'll see you on next week's episode.